somebody Drinking Buddies. I am joined by Nick Taylor from Found North here today. Uh, we had him once on the channel before and we had such a great interview. I was really excited to have an opportunity to bring him back. So Nick, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, hey man, thank you first of all for uh, having me back. I had a great time with you the first time and I've been, uh, I've been looking forward to this all week. So I'm pumped to be back. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Nick Taylor. I'm the, the head blender and co-founder of Found North. Um, and uh, believe it or not, this is my this is my 10th OND, which is crazy um, in the industry. So OND, for those of you who don't know, October, November, December is when uh, it used to be. I don't know if it still is, but it used to be that 70% of all whiskey was sold in these three months each year. Wow. Um, so as you can imagine... Uh, we are we are in the thick of it, and uh, you know we just released uh, batch eight a couple weeks ago, and then followed it up with the release of uh, of Peregrine um, a couple days ago. So it's been uh, it's been a crazy time here at Found North. Uh, yeah, I gotta say times. the fact that you guys have delivered four releases this year that are getting as high praise as you, as they have um, is just incredibly. Awesome. I, I mean, Wild Turkey didn't have four new releases this year that were good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, and I, I, I take that as high praise because I, uh, I love that bird. Uh, I'm a Me big too. fan of Wild Turkey. I've always been a big fan of Wild Turkey. Um, some of those like eight-year Austin Nichols old uh, Wild Turkeys are some of my favorite Dusties that I ever get my hands on. So, uh, no, I, I love that, and I appreciate that. We, we, um, we've, we've. We've been really excited about the releases this year, and, and I think uh, you know the, the interesting thing about the interesting thing about our team is that that we didn't start on the production side. So what I mean by that mm -hmm. is like uh, you know most people who launch a brand uh, have worked at a distillery or uh, have been blenders in the past, or you know have done something on the production side, something on the supply side, um, and you know our team. Our team of four, um, which has been the same team of four since we started Found North, uh, we have uh, one guy who was the Spirits Buyer Liquor Store. Um, my brother and I did brand ambassador work. I actually started my career as a as a whiskey buyer at a at a uh, chain of retail shops in uh, in Massachusetts, and our our my assistant blender um, was a uh, really serious bartender before he before he became the brand ambassador for. Uh, Edrington for, for uh, McAllen and Highland Park, but basically our our whole team uh, had, was was always on the, the customer facing side, and so learning how to blend has been quite a process for us, um, and and you know took took a, a a lot of a lot of trial and error with the first couple of batches, but the benefit of that is we feel like we feel like we're getting better, you know we feel like we're we're starting to understand how to how to think about how to construct the whiskeys, um, what works, what, what, what sort of shortcuts you can take to, to troubleshooting any problems you have with the blend. Um, and I think we're really starting to, as we've, as we've found our stride and, and started to have a lot of confidence in our blending ability. Um, now we've really started to do some more experimenting and, and kind of, um, uh, adventure seeking, so to speak, in our in our whiskey making process. Yeah, and I think that's really cool because uh, uh, one thing that I've liked is, all, all, like every single new release from you guys, I find something in it that I like better than the last one. Not necessarily saying each batch gets better, but there's something uniquely different that I like more about each one. So I'm really excited to try the two new ones because. Uh, I think that seven, five, and then that second summit were amazing. I, like some of the best whiskeys I've ever tasted. But then also batch three, that rye was just so incredible. Uh, it's it's very rare to find a rye that good. I, I am a rye lover, but there's it's higher. It's harder to reach that peak <laughs> with a rye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've done a little home blending myself, just mostly for fun and. Uh, you know, for those of you out there who've never tried it, it is it is a challenge. You can't just take two good whiskeys and mix them together and make something better. In fact, you probably made something worse than either of the two whiskeys on their own. 
Um, you know, it, it, one of the one of the best blends I've ever done. I take something I don't even like and blend it with something I do, and it becomes better than either of the products in the first place. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's a strange it's a strange thing to do, and and uh, I know there's a science to it. And can you give us a little bit about like what you've learned about blending? Like what what is some some things yeah. that like along the way you've learned has been uh, don't do that or uh, you know um, this uh, this helps that type of thing. Yeah, well, you already said the first thing that we ever learned, which was um, you, you can't take good whiskey A and good whiskey B and assume that by combining them, you're going to get better whiskey C. You know what I mean? Like, you can't yeah. just take two good whiskeys and slap them together. Um, and, and and that was confusing. Um, that, was a, that was a challenge early on uh, because you, you just assume, you're like, hey, well, this is really good and this is really good, so we're going to combine these and we're going to get something great. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and that that led us uh, that really led us towards you know I think coming from the customer facing side there's this tendency that we have to try to quantify everything all the time right um, in whiskey you see a lot but like there there are lots of numbers right there's always mm-hmm. the but you know from the the grain ratio or the mash bill right we're looking at numbers you look at the ABV it's a number um, you get dirty and scotch and it's you know it's parts per million phenols. Um, it's every whiskey's got a rating. You know, the 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 desire to organize whiskey through quantifying it um, is is very natural, and I get it. I get why we do it, and it can be extremely useful um, when we're trying to describe things that we like or things that we want to convey to other people. This is why I like this whiskey, right? Um, and and so. You know, for, for us, in the same way of being like, okay, well, this whiskey's a, a 9 out of 10, and this whiskey's a 9 out of 10, so we put it together, hopefully we'll get a 10 out of 10. Uh, that, that didn't work. Mm-hmm. And when when we started thinking about it that way, we, 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 we started sort of changing our perspective on whiskey. And, and instead, of, um, instead of thinking about it in either as a, a sort of uh, – a collection of tasting notes. That's the mm-hmm. other thing that, that 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 you find out quickly, which is like you make a blend, right? And mm-hmm. so I make a blend, and let's say it's thirty percent, you know, this component, seventy percent this component, just to, just to keep it simple. And you you're like, okay, well, what do I think about this blend? So then you start describing it. You're like, well, this blend has, you know, these flavor notes. It's got you know this strawberry note, and it's got this you know butterscotch note, and it's got this cinnamon note. Okay, already sounds like good whiskey, by the way. But yeah. <laughs> let's say you do that, and then you change the ratio, and you change it to twenty-five and seventy-five. All of a sudden, all those notes change. Yeah. But has the whiskey actually gotten any better? Right, and it's like that. That became really hard to understand because you're like, well, now the strawberry is raspberry, the butterscotch is vanilla, and the cinnamon is nutmeg, but did the whiskey get any better? Um, and so the, the 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 way that that I started thinking about it was much more structurally, right? Um, whiskey, when it's described as a set of tasting notes, um, does a disservice to the experience because the whiskey is experienced over the course of time, right? Even if that time is two seconds or three seconds, a good whiskey evolves across the palate. Um, and what what we started what we started to really appreciate was if I have whiskey A and whiskey A has a lot of flavor on the front of the palate, and I mix it with whiskey mm. B and whiskey has a lot of flavor on the back of the palate, then you start to get these whiskeys that tell a story that evolve over time, and that's when you start making really good whiskey. Um, and that was when we we started to to sort of piece together much better blends was okay, this whiskey may be great for the first 70% of the whiskey drinking experience, but it falls off a cliff. Yeah. And that's a problem. And we don't like whiskeys that fall off a cliff. So transitioning our thinking of the whiskey from, hey, this is a collection of tasting notes to, hey, this is a, this is a song that's being sung over the course of two or three seconds, and it needs to be in tune the entire time, and it can't have a big gap in the middle of it. Um, those those kind of that that sort of re- rewiring of our brain um, as a as a thought process really changed the um, the blending for us uh, uh, overall. 
Do you find that if you take something with like an exceptional nose, but maybe like a short finish, and you blend it with something that has a longer finish, does that nose still carry over, or do you lose some of that, and then maybe the finish gets shorter? Like, how how often do those types of things happen? Yeah, that 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 happens. There there are times where you're like, uh, particularly when you have a a, a a a larger blend, right? You, in terms of larger, in terms of the number of whiskeys you're using, you're using four or five whiskeys, right? And and you know you're tasting it, and you're going, okay, this is great we have the we have the the backbone we have the the skeleton of a mm-hmm. great whiskey here but you know we've got a great nose and a great and a great palate but it's not enough finish and this one component that we're using is 15 percent. what if we bumped it up to 18 percent? well when you do that the first challenge is where do you take those three percentage points from right do you take mm-hmm. them evenly one 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 or do you take three of them from one particular component? And a lot of that is instinct, and, and you've done it enough times where you're like, yeah, I think we can take a little away from here and add it here, and it's going to work out. But then you do it, and you taste it, and you, didn't, you, don't, solve, you don't solve the problem, and you ruin the nose. It happens yeah. all the time, right? Um, but sometimes it works out, and that, those, those kind of aha moments, that's actually the most exciting part of the process is, you know, that happened with Batch 8, by the way. Mm. Batch 8, we, um, with Batch 8, Batch 8 was fascinating because we, we designed the blend, and, and the way it works is a lot of times we'll, we'll design a blend and we'll reach out to one of our partner distilleries or, or, you know, we reach out to one of our partner distilleries in Canada where a lot of the volume is coming from for a certain blend. And we'll say, hey, we're going to, you know, this is the test blend. This is the design. We're going to send you like the components you need to recreate the test blend. And we'll literally send them the components. They'll pull fresh samples from the, the liquid we own and they'll try to recreate what we're making. Right. Mm-hmm. It's, it's pretty nuts. And then they send it to us and they say, is this what, you know, we're ready to fat our end of the, of the liquid and send it to you. But does this match what you're making? And, Fifty percent of the time, it doesn't, and we're really, Interesting. really picky. We're really, really picky, and and we actually had a conversation with one of the distillers we were working with, and and they said, "Hey, look, you know, our quality control team is going through thousands of blends every year. You know, your what you're tasting may fall outside of the realm of what of of what you want, but it would pass our QC. It would pass our quality control." Uh, and that was why with with this blend with batch eight, we actually decided to do the whole vatting process ourselves this time. Mm. So we just said, just send the components in in tote in food grade tote, and that way when they get here, they're they've already married, right? Because if you're using like if I'm using five barrels of um, you know a corn component that's aged a certain way. If you just pull one barrel sample out of that, that's not representative of all five barrels. It's close, but yep. it's not representative. That's it. true. And so that's where we, we've been having problems. It's just like we're working with the barrel sample, but then it doesn't scale up the way we want it to. So we said, okay, that the components, and then we will recreate it, having it sort of 95% done, right? Because we've basically yeah. gotten it as far as we can. And then once we get the components, we'll pull, we'll pull samples and we'll finish it. And so we were doing that, and in the really in the twelfth hour. I mean, at eleven fifty nine. I'm not kidding. Literally, it was like midnight the night before we were making the blend. I was working on it with Sammy, my my assistant blender. Um, we've been working on it for days, trying to get it exactly right, and we couldn't quite recreate what we had originally made. And we were tweaking it, tweaking it, tweaking it. And it was one of those situations where it was like we had a little problem with the finish. And we would bump this thing up 5% and it would fix the finish and we'd lose the nose. And it was just every time we turned one, turned one dial up, it was turning one dial down. And and I I found, I had an idea literally midnight. And I, <laughs> I sent him an email and said, hey, in the morning before you bat, try this and decide if this, is, if this fixes it. My palate's a little cooked, but I think it fixed all our problems. I think we nailed it. And he tried it in the morning, and he, he just he just he, he texted me back, and he wrote effing perfect. And we, <laughs> nice. we batted it up. 
Um, so it, it's that's really the like that that's really the exciting moment where you're like you you just you have an idea you're trying to you're trying to tweak it you're trying to get it right and it works and you just go oh this is some beautiful music we, we we've we've got it. Yeah, so one thing that I've definitely noticed um, is when we first, when I first had you on for the interview, um, you could still go online and buy many of the older uh, batches online. And now you seem to have had a big peak in success because uh, now you those you found 08 is already sold out online, correct? And so is the 20 year. The 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 08 sold out in about a day which is just crazy because you're right we had we had like you could still buy batch three i mean you you could buy some of the early batches um up until quite recently um and they're still they're still lying around in stores which is great you know our Mm -hmm. our our, um you know our our retail footprint has is really increased and so um you know in a lot of markets you can walk into a store and find batch three batch four um, that's awesome a batch five um, but uh, yeah recently it's just gone crazy the, 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 the peregrine sold out in I'm not kidding it sold out in one minute online when we released it on Tuesday it yeah the number of people crazy. in my uh, discord were able to get a bottle because they uh, they were on it right when it released and it was pretty cool everybody was really excited about it I'm excited people got it I was bummed we, we just I can't tell you, I, I, I probably answered at least 200 emails in the last two days from people who said, hey, I, I had it in the cart, and it oh. and it, it's, it, it didn't prompt transaction, you know, and I'm like, oh, God. Yeah. You know, the, the, it sucks, it sucks. Well, I mean, it is part of the, the success that's going to happen, unfortunately. I mean, once people realize how good your stuff is, it is going to be more of a challenge to get your hands on it. It's you, What you're doing is very special, and um, it's when you're releasing whiskey as good as you are, people are going to be knocking down doors to try to get it when they realize how good it is. And you mentioned Batch 5, which is another question I had. Um, are you Is there another weeder coming? Because that one was really special. So I, I'm I'm so glad I, you know it's it's funny because uh, you mentioned uh, three five and seven as 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 batches that really mm-hmm. nailed it for you and um, and you know two four and six are are kind of the most uh, I would say bourbon adjacent whiskeys we've made mm-hmm. um, and tend to be the ones that everybody uh, is, is is hunting out all the time. And, and three, five, and seven are probably my three favorite we've made. Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah, I think that three is, ju- for rye, it's, to get a rye that good is a challenge. To get a rye that good, you're talking Thomas Handy, you're talking Michter's Barrel Strength. You know, you, you it's difficult to get a, to get a rye that good. I, 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 I love that you said that. It really is. Rye, rye is so much harder to blend. Um, it's so, so much harder to blend because... Um, spiciness is inherently astringent Mm -hmm. Um, and so you know which which makes a ton of sense you know if you had a if you had a spoonful of cinnamon um, it's not going to go well right I mean it's it's like spiciness is 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 very drying and not in like a pleasant tannic way it's Mm -hmm. very drying in kind of an astringent sharp way Um, and so when when we make rye it's a constant battle between preserving the flavors and 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 eliminating the astringency. And batch three took the the greatest number of test blends. It was like we made we made and and seriously deliberated on I think like close to 150 test blends. Wow. It is so <laughs> difficult to make. And and like the other ones, it's like 15. You know what I mean? It's it's literally 10. percent um, But uh, but but three was yeah that was that was how I felt about three and five. Five, I, I think, five for people who've tasted it tends to be um, tends to tends to be people's favorite. Uh, mm-hmm. But a lot of people, when they came out, you know, five wasn't much 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 less expensive than um, than six because it, it had a substantial amount of twenty one year in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but we also used an eight year in it, so it's the lowest age statement we've ever had. And I think as people were getting familiar with Found North, they were looking and going, okay, I can 
it's been 120 years, you know, and I understand, right? It's like, you've never yeah. had the brand before. You're hearing things about it and you can spend 120 bucks on a eight year age statement, or you can spend 140 bucks on a 17 year age statement. I understand why people gravitated towards six, but five, I just think was a really magical whiskey. And to answer your question, I, I'm, I, we are, we are trying to recreate, uh, the, not recreate it, but create the next iteration of it. Um, but the wheat component, actually, the eight-year wheat component that we used in that whiskey, we only had three barrels of. Mm. It was a really special three barrels. That was why it was a relatively short release. I think it was like 2,100 or just under 2,100 bottles, which is one of our smaller releases. Uh, and, uh, and that was because we just simply didn't have a lot of the wheat. We've been hunting hunting like crazy for good wheat for the last like 18 months and we found some that wasn't quite where we wanted it but we've recast it and we've been we've been sampling it i actually literally just retasted it for the first time in several months um uh yesterday i i tasted a sample of it and it's it's coming along really well i haven't tried blending with it yet but if we can get the if we can get the blend right, and I have some ideas on how to get the blend right. If we can get the blend right, we will we will release another weeder next year. Nice. Yeah, that one was one that I hyped really hard on the channel, and I know a couple people who went online and bought a bottle, and once they cracked it, went back online and bought two or three more. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'm glad. That's what I'm um, here. That one was one that I just think is is really special. I mean, they are they are all very very good. Um, I, I'm I'm uh, planning to put I'm about ready to start a year end um, best of the year blind flight or blind you know tournament and uh, I want to have seven and eight in there. Um, so they I think they will both do really well. I have not tried eight yet, but the fact that I've heard people say they like it better than seven I think is really impressive. So. Well, it's 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 super interesting. I, I, I'm I'm excited that people liked eight as much as they did um, because you know six, we had such a positive reaction on six. Six six was six was a was a sort of a, a doorbuster for us in terms of a, a lot of people. You know, I get a lot of emails from people, and and a lot of people say to me. You know, found North Batch Six was the first one I've had, and I haven't missed a batch since. You know, it's like yeah. it's it's um, Six was kind of a a gateway into Found North for a lot of people, and I I love Six. To, to be honest, I absolutely adore Six. And Six, when we made the test blend, um, was my favorite whiskey we had made. And when it scaled up, interestingly, um, you know, I, I I don't know if you've ever done a lot of cooking for a larger number of people. One weird thing that happens in cooking is you take a recipe and if you quadruple a recipe, you can't just quadruple all of the Mm -hmm. ingredients. Um, It doesn't work. It doesn't behave in a totally proportional way, which, which I find confusing, frankly. Totally. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But blending is kind of the same. Um, And so, you know, we got the test blend and we said, yep, this is exactly what we want it to be. And then we scaled it up, and the finish was a, a little different than what I wanted. Um, and and you know and so the the finish was was slightly different than I wanted. And when we when we made seven, um, I was really trying to correct for the finish on seven um, because I think I think particularly with really high proof whiskeys, sometimes the the whiskey uh world conflates heat with finish so something can be really warming on the finish but mm. not super flavorful um and i think sometimes people go oh this finish is great and i'm tasting it and going mm, the finish is okay it's just you can you notice it because it's it's really it's got a lot of warmth and i like warmth on the finish but what i really want to come through on the finish is flavor Right. Yeah. And actually, flavor without heat is an ideal finish. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. Seven nails it. Seven nails it. But seven was slightly brighter in profile, just a little bit more fruit forward. And so we've had a lot of people. We were, there's been a big split on. There's been a big split on six and seven. When seven came out, 
there was a lot of people who said, I love seven, but six is my favorite. And there were a lot of people who said, wow, I thought six was great, but seven's, seven's the one for me. And, uh, and, and that was, that was great feedback with eight. I wanted it to be a darker, richer, heavier flavor profile, uh, that was reminiscent of six, but I wanted it to have the success from a finish standpoint that seven had. And so I'm, 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 I'm really digging the feedback we're given because, um, I think we accomplished what, what we were really setting out to do on that one. And, and I'm excited to see how you feel about it because I, I, I think, you know, with five and seven being, being really high on your, on your, on your charts for, for found North, it'd be interesting to see if, if we, if we kind of split the difference between six and seven in a way that hits it for you with eight. Yeah. Yeah. The other one that I think was really special this year, I, you can't sleep on the second summit as well. That was, that was such a great, uh, you know that that cherry finish really just does something a little bit extra special on batch six and and brings that you know some of those like nutty qualities, but it doesn't completely take over. Uh, I really like that one. My brother's favorite whiskey we ever made by far. He's obsessed with it. I don't blame him. I, I love seconds of it. Yeah, um, yeah. I I wanted to put uh, all three of those in the tournament, but I decided to keep two per distillery. Uh, purely because I felt like if I went, if I if I let more than two in, I felt like I'm between between Fountain North and Jack Daniels. I might have like ten whiskeys. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I appreciate so, that. Um, well, let's see. Um, so what's the oldest whiskey you guys have ever worked with? The 27 year that's in Peregrine. Okay. Uh, so oldest whiskey we've ever worked with. It's not the oldest whiskey we've sampled. I, I've had I've had some 32, 34 year old stuff uh, that that we had an opportunity to buy, but it's just too over oaked. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of interesting because you can get over oaked bourbon at at twelve years sometimes. I mean, yeah. not necessarily all the time, but you know, sometimes that happens. So so when you're dealing with, I guess, the colder climates and the 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 reused barrels. Uh, uh, that's it. Yeah. 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 yeah the, the, the interesting thing about, I mean, the really interesting thing about Canada is that the, um, you know, down here south of the, the, the Canadian border, we, we think of Canada as this like, this like, you know, Arctic circle. Mm-hmm. Um, and the truth is where most whiskey is made in Canada, the climate and the, the climate cycle is, is quite similar to um, some of the major whiskey making places in, in the U.S. just, you know, throughout the year an average of 10 degrees colder yeah yeah so it has the same huge you know hot to cold swings but it's just about 10 degrees different um and so the the wood extraction is still pretty high to be honest uh but the the but you you nailed it it's really the there's two factors one the the higher um the, the higher fill strength um makes it makes it less will actually kind of protect the whiskey over the long term makes it a little less extractive uh, the more water you add to the to the whiskey before filling it the more you're going to get the the kind of heavier wood congeners mm-hmm. so when you're looking at kentucky bourbon that's that's 12 years old it's in new wood and it's filled at you know 56 57 percent abv that thing's going to get woody as hell after 10 years uh, now in canada where you put something in it you know, 70% or 65%, something up in that, in that range, which is higher than the, the, the sort of legal minimum for, uh, the legal maximum, I mean, for bourbon. Mm-hmm. Um, and they do things all the time, like, um, and, and we actually have started to do this on our own, where it's 15 years in refill or ex bourbon, and then it sees new oak mm-hmm. um, for the first time after 15 years. You, you get this incredible development of the spirit from the oxidative process over 15 years and then you put it in new wood and you and you get all of the kind of the wood-based congeners that we love in bourbon um you can do really really special stuff it's 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 actually it's probably my favorite thing about working with with corns from canada is we're dealing with a little bit higher proof um and we're we're often dealing with with a with some sort of used oak into new oak regimen that that gives us access to flavors that, that just you, you can't really get in bourbon because of the rules. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, the one thing that I find to be super interesting is, you know, living out here in the desert. You know, the last time we talked about Whiskey Del Bac, where most of their whiskey's, you know, about 13 months old, uh, you know, and they, they deliver such a depth of flavor at that young age because of, yeah. of our climate here, you know. So it is very interesting how much the climate does affect the whiskey. It is it is a really interesting thing. And, you know, the, the temperatures being somewhat similar in Kentucky to what they are in, in uh in Canada is a really interesting thought process that, that I humidity level is an underrated aspect of that too. And there's yeah, a virtually yeah. no humidity here. So, <laughs> no humidity there, right? so you're, you're getting so much, uh, water evaporation from the yeah. barrels, right? There you way more water evaporation from the barrels. So you get a really concentrating effect on, on the, 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 the liquid that's left in the barrel is, is very concentrated. Right, which is which is fascinating. You know, I I, I was blown away to discover that when, when sort of early on in my whiskey career that most of the wood extraction happens in the first two hundred days. It's mm-hmm. like ninety percent happens in the first two hundred days. Now that is such a generalization because that doesn't factor in humidity, what season, what the fill strength, well, any of these different things. But it's wild the that we. Um, we present as an industry such a simple explanation of wood maturation to the market, to the, to the marketplace, to consumers, but it's way more complex. Oh yeah, uh, and, and it's it's I find it fascinating uh, to sort of dig into the the nitty gritty of barrel maturation. Yeah, it it is very it's very interesting. I think of something like uh, you know, Still Austin out of Texas is you know they deliver these uh, cask strength bourbons that that are two years old that drink like 10 year Kentucky. And, you know, it's just, it's very interesting how, how much change there can be from area to area, humidity to him to dry, you know, all of these things can affect it. It's just really cool. And we'll see what happens in the next 10 years with climate controlled warehousing. Old Forces oh, yeah. are already doing some really interesting stuff with heat cycling. And yeah. I've had some of their, their heat cycled four year. That's fabulous. And I know some people don't like it because they, they, there's a, there's uh, there's a connection to the climate, the environment, the, the the nature of whiskey making that that is very romanticized and for good reason. I think it's kind of the it's like the old magic, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. But but uh, but at the same time, there have been some real advancements in the processing of of you know how we do our barrel maturation in the industry um, that. And, and some, some incredible developments in terms of wood seasoning. I think that's another place where there's, you know, there, the, like Kelvin is doing some crazy mm-hmm. stuff with, with, with doing the, the air drying for a period of time and then doing kind of the steam drying to finish it off and create more consistent wood. I, I, think, that's, I think that stuff is, is going to have a huge impact on sort of not just the overall quality, but definitely the, the – access to flavors that the, that the industry has, the whiskey industry has over the next 10 years. That'll be fascinating. For sure. I, I definitely think that there's a lot of really cool innovation coming. Um, you know, I mean, it just even even till a few years ago, nobody was really even finishing bourbon. Um, you know, it would just be straight bourbon and that's it. Uh, but, you know, finished bourbon was, was not really all that common even until, you know, things like Angel's Envy and stuff like that kind of you know, made a name for it in the industry, but yeah, there, there, there's been some great sort of trailblazers for, for finished, um, American whiskeys. Uh, you know, I think, I think high West did a lot with the, Oh Midland, yeah. I, the Midsummer mm-hmm. nice Dram and then, um, the, the, uh, the, um, the big one is of course, uh, you know, I think barrel, barrel mm-hmm. craft spirits. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think they just did so much for, um, both raising the, or, or I guess erasing some of the stigma around around just the word blend, um, and 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 also just doing such interesting finishes. Um, I, I think it, you know, frankly, it made us. Uh, it's it's given us a lot more confidence, not not just in the process itself. Um, we've always sort of believed in the process, but in how the process is going to be received for a thing like Peregrine. So I, I don't know if you've had a chance to to kind of read much about what we did with Peregrine. It's only been on the market for five minutes here, mm-hmm. so I, I won't be surprised <laughs> if you had no. too much yet. But but with Peregrine, 
um, we've been fascinated by this process that we did for Peregrine for the last couple of years. And what we effectively did was um, we created a blend and then we recast the entire blend into three different barrel types. And then after a further maturation in those three different barrel types, we re-blended it, right? Um, okay. And, and that would be something fun. similar to what barrel does, correct? I, I don't know if barrel... I, I, I don't know exactly how, how barrel does it in terms of... Um, because the, I know they do things where they take they take barrels and they recast them and then they blend them at the end. Mm-hmm. But with the, the, the if you're doing that with bourbon you have a pretty uniform profile that you're putting into the, into the barrels. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if you were to take component whiskeys Good call. in Canadian, there's no uniformity at all. So, so effectively what's, what's really cool about Canadian whiskey is this single stream distillation where they're doing hundred percent corn, hundred percent weed, hundred percent rye, hundred percent barley ferment, distill age separately. And then, you, you get to, you know, with the, like with the batches, you get to just design the whiskey exactly how you want it to be. And they're giving maximum flexibility. So for us, we were really taking advantage of that, of that flexibility by, um, by, by designing the blend with the further maturation in mind. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're huge whiskey nerds. I mean, we're like the biggest whiskey nerds you can imagine. Yeah. And, and so one of the things we had always thought about was um, on the scotch side of things, to make good whiskey, in to make good scotch whiskey, the the I think the most critical component is choosing the right maturation to satisfy the distillate that you create. Uh, so if you create a very light profile distillate, it will be served better being aged in ex bourbon. Mm-hmm. And if you make a really heavy, oily distillate, it'll be served better by going into, you know, Spanish oak sherry buffs, right? And that's mm-hmm. that's the that's like the, the big dichotomy in in Scotch whiskey, or at least in single malt whiskey. So we we looked at that and we said, Well, that's great, but what if we wanted to actually just shape the distillate to whatever maturation we pick? Uh, So instead of just taking the barrels and matching it to the liquid, shaping the liquid beforehand to really fit a very particular aging regimen and then and then re-blending it. Right. So when we made Peregrine, we didn't use all the barrels. Uh, So we like literally made a blend, recast it into limousine oak, uh, American oak, ex cognac and new American oak. And then once we had done the further maturation, we went through those barrels and we um, we went through those barrels and we, we, we said, okay, we're going to use this one and this one and this one and a little of this one and, and here's the final blend and this is Peregrine. Um, and that, that was that's a very unique process for us. That's, that's something we've never done before. And my goodness, did it work better than we could have hoped. I'm, I'm so excited for you. I, I think particularly with the profile that you've liked from Found North, I think mm-hmm. Peregrine's going to be your favorite. I'm, I'm, I'm calling my shot here. I think Peregrine's going to be my favorite yeah i i can't wait to try that one i am uh i'm a big fan of what you guys are doing in general and just to see a 20-year age statement on a bottle of whiskey that you could go online and and buy right away is is pretty cool for american you know american north american whiskey 20 years old you go online you can buy it it's it's pretty cool that's yeah yeah and that's i know that that's that's one of the most fun parts and and honestly the 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 youngest component was the 20 year ride. Mm-hmm. There's 23, there's 22, 23, 24 and 27 year old corns in there. Uh, and, and it's not like, I can't remember the exact percentage, but it's not like it's 1% 27 year. It's a, it's a good, yeah. it, it, it makes up a good portion of this, uh, of this whiskey. Um, and it, it did, it did wonderful things to the, to the original blend. It really did. Yeah, you guys are doing a really good job with transparency on your on your labels and what you're what you're listing online. Um, you know, some of the some of the uh, companies struggle with that, and I know NDAs get in the way. But uh, you know, I just think that that's another thing that's commendable about what you guys are doing is is how much transparency you're giving as far as you know. These are the mash bills we use. This is the this is how old this barrel was. You know, this is, you know, it's just really cool to see that. Um, the, yeah, and I think I appreciate that because. There's a, 
there is a little balance, you know, um, for example, with the labeling, when we when when we first designed the label, and we were using you know three, four, five components that had um, all interesting aging regimens, it was very tempting, and we looked at we actually looked at a design of putting on the front label all the different maturations that were in there, and it was just a mess mm-hmm. and confusing, you know. And so we're like, okay, well, we'll put it on the website. Yep. What components we used and how uh, we barrel used it. barrel does the same thing where you can kind of dive in a little deeper if you want more most it's some people don't want more right? they just want good whiskey so they don't really care about the nitty-gritty of the you know breakdown of everything it also you know it's it's also confusing as hell <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like okay this this got but it, at first it was informative but now it's just convoluted um and and that's that's a that's a that's a tough needle of thread that we try. We've, we've done our best to get right. I, I think, um, I think the, 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 the goal for us in the goal for us from a community, from a real communication standpoint is, is not just to convey the, the liquid that's in there, but I think the really cool thing is the, is the intentionality behind the whiskey. Um, because I, I think of whiskey as like, it's a lot more than just the taste of the liquid, right? And, mm-hmm. and I love, for example, I love that you do blind tastings, and I love doing blind tastings. Um, but but at the same time, like, I think that's a way to isolate one of the parts of the whiskey drinking experience. Mm-hmm. Knowing what you're drinking and why and how it fil- fits into the this kind of many century old ongoing story that is whiskey right like whiskey has evolved as an entire industry and its yep. entire process and its entire liquid um for 500 years you know it used to be this pretty disgusting you know white lightning that the scots were and the irish were making in you know little tiny copper pots to this really developed evolved process um, and so I think understanding, you know, I think a big part of the transparency is, hey, this is what's in here, but also like, this is how we tried to fit this whiskey into the entire experience mm-hmm. of drinking whiskey. You know, if you're a if you're a bourbon drinker, I think you'll enjoy Found North Peregrine because it has bourbon notes, it has bourbon profile, it has a bourbon esque uh, grain grain bill yeah like it has these things but it also does things that bourbon doesn't do and frankly if you're a you know if you're a scotch drinker who who's maybe turned off by bourbon this 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 actually fits kind of somewhere halfway because it has a lot of the interesting wood maturation style that you might see in a in an old single malt so trying to sort of fit it in there and and say hey this is this is where this is where this whiskey fits on the Venn diagram of flavors, and this is why we made it that way, and this is our excitement around it. I think that gives the whole experiencing uh, the whole experience of, of buying a bottle, opening it, reading about it, drinking it, um, a lot more color. You know, I think it just gives it. It just fills in the whole story in a, in a way that is really, I think, unique and special to this industry. Yeah, I definitely agree there. Uh, sometimes when I'm doing the blind flights, it, it, it does. I tend to focus on one thing and it can throw off the way I would taste it if I knew what I was drinking. You know, maybe there's just like one tiny little note that I, I pick up and it's not my favorite note at that time, but maybe the next day I drink it I, and I love that note. You know, it's so it, there is a challenge there. And I definitely would say that when you're doing a, a, a blind flight, you have to take the results with a little bit of a grain of salt because you, there is a really good chance that, you know, you, you do the exact same blind the very next day, you might get completely different results because... The context matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I had yeah. maybe I had a greasy cheeseburger for lunch, and yeah. uh, you know this what this this particular bourbon isn't working with that, you know, or whatever yes. it might be. Yes. It's... I think I think super old whiskeys, uh, really super old whiskeys, don't perform nearly as well in a blind. Um, Focusing, you all... focus on the oak, and and they can even if even if you know even if you have a. 50 year old scotch that spent its entire life in a fourth fill barrel and never got over oaked there's kind of a there's kind of this interesting 
uh, I don't know, sometimes with super aged whiskeys, you'll get a, like a dusty old library book mm, mm-hmm. that, that you can only get from these like hyper aged whiskeys. And it's fascinating and it's delightful and it's a unique experience. But if you tasted it without sort of the context of knowing that this is unique and that it's unique because it's so old and the kind of magic of, hey, you know, somebody put this in cask and it's probably dead. Is you, yeah. know, you just it's it's hard it's a hard thing to appreciate in the liquid without without that context. And and I don't think it's a bad thing if you like a whiskey because you know, if you enjoy whiskey more because it's older and literally the number makes you happy, I don't think that's bad. I, you know, I, I think a lot of yeah. times that, 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 that people will be like, Well, if you if you didn't know this was an old whiskey you wouldn't you wouldn't like it as much. And it's like, well, yeah, but, but part of this is the really cool human experience of um, life t- lifelong projects that you get to drink. But right it's now. also like there's a, there's an amount of uniqueness there too. Like yes. you hear, oh, whoa, there's 27 year old stuff in here. I gotta try this. Or or heck, even whiskey del Bach. Wait a minute, their whiskey's 13 months old and it tastes this good. What it are they doing? Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. It it, it, it plays out on both ends of the on both ends of the spectrum in a in a really fun and exciting way. For sure. So, what's your favorite whiskey of all time? It's. I mean, not not to be, not not to be. Uh, you got you got. Am I allowed to? Am I allowed to include Found North or not? Cause yes. I, 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 how about I, this? I, okay, I got an idea. How about your favorite whiskey from Found North of all time, and then your favorite non whiskey from Found North of all time? My my favorite whiskeys from Found North of all time. It, it's it's a tough one between Batch One and Peregrine. Okay. Uh, batch One, not because it's the best whiskey we've made, but Batch One because. It was a nine-month project, and it changed our lives. That's awesome. Uh, Peregrine, Peregrine, because, one, I think it's the best-tasting thing we've ever made, for my palate. Yeah, other people will like other things better, I, I suspect. But for my palate, like, no, we haven't made a whiskey that, that matches what I love about whiskey more than Peregrine. But beyond that, uh, you know, when we made batch one, we, we bought the components we needed to complete the blend. Right, so it's like, yeah, we designed the blend, but we had no control of the process other than designing the blend, and that's a huge part of the process, right? Like, especially with Canadian, where they've made it that way, where most of the flavor decisions are made at the end of the process, not at the beginning. But we didn't do the maturation, we didn't own the the liquid, we weren't, you know, managing the stocks, managing the bottling process, managing, you know, it was very much hands off. Peregrine, we. We own the liquid that we used. We've been aging it in our way. We designed the blend. We did the vatting ourselves. We recast it into barrels that we bought that we picked for this process. And then we reblended it to our specs, bottled it, did everything. You know, we owned so much of the process. And to own that much of the process and then have the whiskey turn Count out the that way good. it did, it's, it's, just a, it's just, you know, for us, that's the context that matters so much. And that's why making a great whiskey that, 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 that falls under those sort of that spectrum that those those processes is so special to us um, so I would say Peregrine probably probably wins it for us or, or for me I would say of, of Found North Whiskies um, in terms of my favorite whiskey of all time um, I had a 43 year old 1969 vintage uh, uh, Karizawa um with my parents at a restaurant in called Saturn that doesn't exist anymore in Paris, uh, that that was so freaking special because because the whiskey was astounding. I mean, <laughs> for me, it was a it was a, a a ten out of ten just raw flavor. I think if I blind tasted it, I would have been obsessed with it. But it also did all of the unique things um, to both the Japanese process um, and the uh, and the the, the the just the things that super old whiskeys can do. Um, and then you top that with we weren't we, this wasn't a whiskey specific bar. It had been a whiskey bar that had turned into a restaurant, and they just happened to have, have these that. cars <laughs> out there. 
You know what I mean? It wasn't like they, you know, we didn't go. It wasn't like we walked into Jack Rose and spent a thousand bucks on a on a pour of Karizawa. We spent a hundred bucks on a pour of Japanese whiskey that should have that was you know a fifteen thousand dollar bottle. Um, and uh, it literally went on auction at Le Maison de Whiskey three weeks later and sold for fifteen thousand four hundred um, euros. And, uh, and wow. so that that and then I, it was with my parents in and my brother in Paris. You know, so it's just. Everything that, everything, not just the whiskey, but everything surrounding the whiskey was was perfect. It was serendipitous. It was a magical location. It was a really special, you know, group of people for me in my life. And so I think it was just from a pure whiskey drinking experience. It was about as good as it can get. Um, experience I, matters a lot too, because you know a lot of people buy you know a special bottle and they just let it sit around for a long time and they don't want to open it and they're you know open it and share it with friends it's going to make it's going to make the whiskey taste better you're going to enjoy it more you're You're going to you're going to have a better experience sharing it with friends having a laugh you are it's just it's kind of part of whiskey which is funny because when i think of some of the best pours i ever have i usually am drinking them with like a guest on the channel or I'm on yep. vacation and I spend a little extra money to, to pay, you know, to grab a pour of a GTS from 2018, something like that. You know, uh, those are the ones that they come to mind. And I think it's a, the experience is a huge part of it. Great point. I, we had a we had a, a, a um, we had a guy email us uh, yesterday about buying Peregrine and he was so excited. He got a bottle of Peregrine um, and he just he told us he, he was like. Yeah, I'm so excited! I got a bottle. I'm, I'm giving it to my dad for his 86th birthday. We're gonna crack it on his 86th birthday that's coming up. And he's a huge Canadian whiskey fan and has fallen in love with what you guys are doing at Found North. And I'm just, you know, I'm so excited that I got this bottle. To, to oh, I, God, I, I literally, I say a prayer that it's the best whiskey his dad's ever had. <laughs> I, I want that. I want that for them so badly. You know, I, I and I, the idea of. Um, the idea of making whiskey that that has that kind of that, that creates or or at least just helps facilitate those kind of experiences is literally why we make whiskey. It yeah, is, if you ask that's... me why we make whiskey, it's for that. It is for exactly that. Yeah, and you guys are doing it. You guys are nailing it. I, I think that what you guys are doing is extremely special. Um, you know, I like a lot of the other NDPs that are that are sourcing, you know, bourbons and ryes. In, in, but I, I definitely think that out of the people who are doing sourcing and blending, uh, Found North is the king of the king of the crop, top of the top of the Man. top of the charts. Thank you. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. You know, that includes Barrel, who I also love. That includes Old Carter. That includes like everybody who's doing it. I think you guys are doing the best job of it. Well, thank you, man. I really appreciate that. Well, I better cut this. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Um, everyone get out there and find some Found North. Uh, we're learning that their stuff is selling out quick, so the next time there's a new batch, make sure you're online and ready to get it, or look for it in a retail store if you're in one of the areas where they have uh, Found North available at retail. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks for having Thanks for coming on.